Those that know the Isle of Wight will know the county town of Newport, built when the waterway into Carisbrook, the true capital of our little kingdom, silted up to the point of being nothing more than a small, free-flowing brook. It was said that Newport was built in such a way as to hold the two halves of the isle together, like a delicate thread holding a strained piece of fabric from tearing. Newport was the town that should never have been built. It was not supposed to be there. Yet, it is, and sits, flexing and holding the unravelling of the island at bay. It is said that the minster of St Thomas was built directly on the line where the island would unravel, and thus giving that extra bit of strength to ensure that the unthinkable would never happen. With this sort of pressure, it is no wonder that Newport and St Thomas's Square is subject to some of the strangest phantoms and shades from this county. Every person on the island will know the Square of St Thomas, and every person will know that one avoids that place on lonely evenings when the days are short and the nights are long. This is the situation I found myself in on a rather wet and miserable December evening. The Yule tide was in full swing, and I had been making myself a little too merry with friends that I had not seen in some time. The evening had drawn on, and being that I was the last to leave, the night seemed particularly desolate. This night was one of those winter evenings where the clouds were thick above, and even though the air had a chill, one wouldn't call it cold. I figured the temperature was mild enough that I could easily walk home, and with the added warmth of the seasonal ale still in my cheeks, I began to make my way through the empty streets. As I walked past the secluded square of St. Thomas, a chill went down my spine. And without any warning, the heavens opened up with a loud cracking of thunder. Against my better judgment, I took refuge under the arches in front of the ancient wooden doors of the minster. The wind howled around the square and appeared to pick up pace as it twisted its way through the opening that I now found myself in. The biting air seemed to be mocking me as it stinged my nose and cheek and brought with it droplets of ice-cold rain that pinched my already smarting skin. Oh, how I longed to be at home, sitting in front of the fire, curled up with a book or listening to music, as the bitter storm whirled around outside. Alas, I was not so lucky. The walls radiated their cold, pushing me forward, the wind and rain pushing me backwards. The ruddy glow of the last tipple was now long gone, and I found myself in a state of total soberness and damp dreariness. After a time, however, I thought I heard something, like a faint murmuring coming from deep within the old church. This seemed odd to me, as it was now well past two in the morning, and the building would normally be locked up tight. The prospect of staying where I was, exposed to the elements, didn't seem like a proposition that I could stand much longer. And if there was someone inside, then maybe we could keep each other company until the unpleasant weather stopped. Best case, I find somewhere to while away the time and maybe stave off the chills I was now feeling. Worst case, it was a bunch of kids up to no good, and I could maybe give them a little scare and have the old hulking building to myself for a while. I took the opportunity and turned the handles of the oak doors. They were made of iron and in the shape of great loops. They appeared to serve the purpose of both being knockers and doorknobs. The doors slowly opened and let out a great echoing creak. <laughs> poked my head inside and could not see any signs of life. The building appeared to be empty, except for a small orange-yellow glow off to the side. I stepped over the threshold. I found myself completely and utterly overcome with dread. I told myself to stop being ridiculous, but to be on the safe side I stayed close to the shadows and padded as silently as I could towards the glow that I had spied. The glow finally revealed itself to be that of candles placed haphazardly on a table with wax dripping straight onto the timber. 
In some cases the wax had made little rivers that poured off the table and were creating tiny stalactites as it dripped to the floor. The murmuring I had heard outside had started up again, but this time with some vigour and interspersed with laughter and a kind of singing. I made my way closer and stood behind a large pillar. I took a breath and peeked at the figures. Nothing in this world had prepared me for what I was about to see, and it has haunted me to this day. There were two people. I call them people, but I could hardly say that's what they were. One was a very tall woman with dark brown hair. Her skin was a shade off white, pallid, translucent. She appeared to be floating slightly above the ground, and as such appeared to have no discernible feet or means of locomotion. However, she freely moved about as if walking, but of course made no sound when she did so. Her lips were a deep red, not bright, but a burgundy colour, and when she opened her mouth, her lips shimmered in the candlelight. This in itself would seem strange if it were not for her companion. He was a man of shorter stature, with the most terrifying complexion. He had the face of a wolf with keen and knowing eyes. He had the look of a trickster about him, and you could see that he was the type to be continually scheming. This, however, was not the strangest part, for instead of a normal person's legs, he had two green scaly appendages with three claws at the end that not only served as feet, but as a second set of hands. In his actual hands he held a golden goblet, and in the other a long-handled scythe. The two appeared to be playing some complex game of dice and cards, with rules that I just could not understand. Each would make a turn, and if the woman's move was a success, she would sing a short song of longing that I just could not fully make out. Conversely, if the man's move went well, then he would laugh in that moment, and it was the most evil and guttural thing I had ever heard, <laughs> leaving me feeling like all hope was lost. It was at this point that I decided it was time to leave. I had seen enough, and I did not want to know any more. I turned to leave, and just as I did, something small and red jumped out in front of me. The thing was as fast as lightning, and the next thing I knew, it was upon me and had knocked me to the ground. The imp placed its bony hand upon my mouth, smiling, and said, Shh! It slowly removed its hands, and I dared not say a word. For a moment it looked at me with curiosity, and then in a quiet, shrill voice it said, Get out of here, you fool! Don't you see they're going to play for your life? What? 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 It cut me off and continued, Shut up, you human idiot, and listen! The little imp pointed to the floating woman and said, That is the Sinita. If she wins, then she will take your guilt away. What's wrong with that? I whispered. Oh, but here's the rub, little man. Her brother over there. He pointed lazily in the direction of the wolf-headed man. He is the soul-stealer. And if he wins, then woe be tied. That cup he holds is for your spirit. And from that cup, only the soul stealer drinks. Good God, what are they? I blurted out. You may as well ask for help from God. But he won't help you when it comes to the children of death. Now go! With that I stood up, and as I did I knocked over a nearby stool that hit the ground with a crash. I turned around and saw the two creatures had stopped playing their game and had turned to look at me. At that moment I just ran. I did not stop to look behind me. I just went for the open door. I could see that it was slowly starting to close in front of me. Not on its own, but by the hand of the little red goblin who had, moments ago, tried to advise me to leave. He was laughing at me as I ran, teasing me. Was this his plan? Did he want to 
give me a tiny bit of hope only to have it snatched away at the last second? I pushed on as hard as I could, and as I got there, I slipped through the crack as the door slammed shut behind me, the laughing of the imp still ringing in my ears. As I stood outside the square, I realised that the night was calm, no rain, no wind. The ground was dry and the temperature was mild. I quickly walked away from that place and went promptly home. And now, if the hour is late and the season is dark, I make sure I give that place a wide berth. I don't want to take the chance. Would you? <laughs>